so today's learning outcome for the cognitive level of analysis is to evaluate schema theory with reference to research studies. So here's a brief overview of my video. So we're going to talk about what schema theory is. Then we're going to talk about two studies that support this theory, and then we're going to evaluate this theory. So what is a schema? Well, schema is a mental representation of knowledge. So for example, if we hear the word classroom, what do you guys think about? Well, there may be various arrangements of classrooms, such as this, where students are individually aligned into rows and columns. And then another schema, which may be students in groups. Another schema may be a homeschooler, where there's a tutor and a student. And then the lastly, there may be a circular arrangement where there are a lot of class discussions. So this may be pertain to you. I don't know. For me, I think my classroom schema might be the second one or the first one. And when we typically hear the word classroom, I think about um, a whiteboard, a marker, students, desks, chairs, and um, an apple. I think it's portrayed in the media a lot, like an apple on, on the teacher's desk. Um, but people have different schemas, like I have different schemas than many other people because people have different backgrounds. So schemas can describe how specific knowledge is organized and stored in memory so that it can be accessed and used when it is needed. So schema theory states that what we already know will influence the outcome of information processing. So schema theory involves three steps. The first step is encoding. Well, encoding is transforming sensory information into a meaningful memory. So for example, we smell bread and we realize that this is what bread smells like or we see um, Kim Kardashian either online or in real life and we're like, oh, this is what Kim Kardashian looks like. Then we have the next step, which is storage. Storage is basically maintaining the experience in our memory, and it creates a biological trace of the encoded information. The last step is a retrieval. We recover the experience from our memory. Now, schema theory can either enhance or distort memory. So um, the example on the right is an example of a mnemonic and an example where schema theory can enhance memory. So we have the equation for density. Density is mass over volume. And if we see, it's kind of hard to memorize. So if we see the equation, you know, you realize that it kind of looks like a heart. And we, if we remove the line, yeah, it does kind of look like a heart. So hearts are part of our schema. You know, we see hearts all the time, so it's stored in our memory. Now, if we relate, if we associate the shape of a heart to this equation, we can um, easily remember this equation. Density equals mass over volume, right? But then it can also distort memory. So for example, if we have a cultural stereotype or bias, then it can obviously affect what our memory. So for example, um, I'm going to talk about this later, but um, if we hear a story of Cinderella for the first time, you know Cinderella's godmother makes a carriage for her um, to ride to the ball, right? And then if a person from the 21st century hears this story for the first time, they are not used to, well, typically in in Western culture, um, people don't ride carriages or chariots around, right? So they typically associate modes of transportation with like cars, buses, or taxis or whatever, but not really chariots, right? So they might replace the chariot with um, a conventional mode of transportation, which is buses or taxis. So this is how the, mem the schema theory can distort memory. Now we're going to look at the first study, which is of, on reconstructive memory. This is by Anderson and Pritchard, um, and it was conducted in 1978. So basically, the aim of this study was to investigate if schema processing influences both encoding and retrieval. So encoding is um, putting an experience into the memory, and retrieval is recovering the experience from the memory. So this was a laboratory experiment, which means that this was an in a person's natural um, everyday life, it was actually like people knew this was an experiment. So the procedure, participants were to hear a story on two boys who went to the home of one of them, so after school. And then they were told that um, half of the participants were told that you were to listen to the story on the perspective of a potential house buyer, so a house buyer schema. And then the other half was to listen to the story on the perspective of a burglar, so the burglar schema. These different schemas have different um, memory abilities because if you're on the perspective of a house buyer, you pay attention to things like um, what the wallpaper design is like or how many rooms there are, how many bathrooms there are, like things like that. But then burglars tend to listen to the information where um, 
where the money is stored, when the mom is outside, you know, those things. So house buyers and burglars have different um, aspects of the story to pay attention to. So then they performed a distracting task for 12 minutes because they wanted to unfreshen it, if that's a word, um, from their memory. And then the recall was tested. Then there was a five minute delay and then there was another test. But then in this test, um, before this test, half of the participants were given a different schema. So people who had the house buyer schema um, got the burglar schema and people who got the burglar schema got the house buyer schema. And then the other half were asked to retain their original schema. So people who had the house buyer schema, they listened to the story again in a house buyer schema and then the recall was tested again. Now, what do you think will happen to the recall? Well, the findings show that participants who switch schemas from burglar to home buyer or home buyer to burglar recalled 70% more on the second test. This may be because uh, people who listen to two different schemas have a broader perspective on what the story is on. Now there was a 10% increase in recall of the new schema, maybe because it was a new schema, the second schema, which was more fresh in their brains and then there was a decline in recall of the previous schema which is based on the same reason. The second schema is all obviously fresh in their brains. And then the participants who retained the first schema actually remembered fewer ideas in the second trial. This may be because there has been so much time that passed that they forgot because there was the time for distraction and delay. And maybe because the participants were like tired, they're like, oh, when am I, when is this experiment gonna be over? Because like, when you first start something, you're very energetic and very engaged, but then after a few minutes, you're just like, oh, I give up. Like, maybe the participants had that mindset. Okay, so the conclusion of this study was that schema processing must have some effect at retrieval and encoding. And an evaluation of this study, well, this was very ethical because no one was harmed, no one was like emotionally or mentally hurt, and that this was very highly controlled because it was in a laboratory experiment. Um, so the variables were also controlled. Now, there's benefits for having a laboratory experiment, but this also had a drawback, which is that it lacked ecological validity. So this is never going to happen in real life, you know, like this is a legit experiment, okay? So the second study is a study called The War of the Ghost by Barlett in 1932. So The War of the Ghost is actually a story that the researchers read to the participants. Okay, so the aim of, I mean, not read, but um, had, they had to read. Okay, so the aim of this study was to see if culture affects schema processing and memory. And this was also a laboratory experiment. It's very old, you know, it's in the 1930s. But anyways, English participants were asked to read a Native American folktale. So English people and Native Americans um, obviously have different backgrounds, right? So the Native American folktales on like two boys, you know, two Native American people on the perspective of Native Americans, like they went seal hunting and those things that English participants are not really used to. So they use two methods of recall. One is called serial rep reproduction, which is like the telephone game. The participant reproduces the story, the second person has to reproduce the first reproduction and then um, so on and until there are about six to seven reproductions and then the second method of recall is repeated reproduction, which means one participant reproduces the story after time interval intervals from um, as small as 15 minutes to even several years. And the study found that the story that were recalled became shorter. So that means they um, remembered less detail because, you know, as time passes, you forget a lot of things. And then the story remained coherent. So the researcher Barlett said that this was because people interpreted the story as a whole, so they understood the story and they formed the links and cause and effect relationships. And also the story became more conventional. This means that the participants, after the reproductions, retained only those details that could be assimilated to the shared past experience and cultural background of the participants. So you know how I mentioned that the story involved seal hunting? Well, English participants are not um, really used to the idea of seal hunting, so they switched those to fishing. Yeah, so they kind of remember it according to what they have been raised and they have been taught. 
So the conclusion of the study was that people reconstruct, reconstruct the past by trying to fit it into existing schemas and people try to find familiar patterns in experiences. And the evaluation of the study is that it used unsophisticated method methodology, it had no variables, and it was just like, and it's also very, very old. Oh, and also um, the top, it says study one reconstructive memory. This is actually the study on the world of the ghost. I accidentally made a mistake. And this used dynamic approach, which means that it used um, a culture. And um, this in this case, it used English participants. And this doesn't represent the population as a whole, right? The world as a whole. So that's kind of a thing that this the researcher could improve on. But anyways... Now let's evaluate the schema theory now that we um, looked at two studies. Well, the strength of the schema theory is that it has empirical, empirical evidence. You know, we looked at the study of the War of the Ghosts and we also looked at the reconstructive study. And those also um, both support the schema theory. And th there's also a lot of experiments that I haven't mentioned. And there's a lot of applications to the schema theory, and this helps us understand how memory works and how it can be distorted. However, there's also weaknesses. We cannot observe it. It's very vague, you know, like schema theory. How can we like accurately, numerically um, observe it? No, we can't because this is something that happens in our brains and no one can actually like look at our brains except for MRI scanning, which you can't really see how like schemas are formed yeah so which leads on to the next bullet point which mean uh, which says formation of schemas cannot be tested this experiment was to see if um schema theory was working the formation part cannot be tested so thank you guys for watching this video i hope it really helped for IV psychology or any of you guys like who's taking any psychology course so this is actually my first video um ever on this channel and I'm going to film an intro video as well where I talk about who I am and so stay tuned for that I'm going to post um, videos on psychology as well as biology chemistry and other things that pertain to me and what I know so thank you guys so much for watching I appreciate it a lot thank you